first I'm going to introduce myself, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, talk. I'm going to be talking about WP WebKit and what it can do for you or from the point of view of um, how it can be integrated in many ways in embedded devices or in any kind of product. And uh, I will try to, my goal here is to get you some takeaways, uh, um, like what can it do for you, uh, how to integrate it and what, as, what are some best practices. Um, I've been working for Egalia since a lot of time ago. <laughs> it feels like a full life, 2008. And I've been doing WebKit since 2012. Um, and uh, lately, well, the last eight years maybe, I've been doing uh, improvements on the platform layer, which is the part that integrates us with the rest of the system. Uh, hard hardware bring ups and release management. So if uh, some release is broken, you can blame me <laughs> if it doesn't build uh, from a release. And uh, lately I have been getting into old computers as well. And uh, I'm not going to talk about those because those cannot run uh, web engines or modern ones at least. Uh, but it's, it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. I like, the, I like the Amiga I got recently in particular. Anyway, uh, like I was saying, uh, I'm part of, uh, of Igalia, which is an uh, open source consultancy uh, that has existed for a long time. Uh, it's uh, headquartered in Spain and we have fully remote structure. And uh, if you take out the uh, original creators of web engines, let's say you take uh, Google out of uh, Chromium or Apple out of WebKit, we're the main contributors to them all, basically. Um, and we have contributions in many other open source projects. Um, and we're also members of many open standards group. We think it's important uh, to be there as well. And uh, if you want to talk to me or to any of, uh, of us after the talk, um, there's gonna be, I I'll try to leave some time for questions, of course. Uh, but we have a booth upstairs as well. And we're, you're welcome to come and talk with, uh, with any of us about any of these topics or any other topic you may find interesting to bring up. Um, and like I was saying, um, my plan is to give you a very quick rundown of uh, WP WebKit, um, some notes about what would be a typical process of getting it in, into your device. And um, once we get it there, um, how to maintain it, how to be up to date and uh, incorporate newer versions. And, um, and I will be give anyway at the end a small summary of the main key points of all this. And, um, and um, my goal is that you go uh, back with the idea that, yes, if I need a web engine, WP WebKit can, uh, can be a good option because uh, it's, um, it's quite adaptable. And I think that's one of the, of the main strengths. Like it's designed to be portable in the sense that uh, it can be adapted to specific platforms. Uh, that's something in general about WebKit. Uh, WebKit, the project, is not only Apple doing a web engine for Safari, it has um, customization points. So, for example, on Linux, we can uh, use a different painting engine, like we can use Cairo, or lately we have moving towards Skia, or we can use a different networking stack. So, we can uh, have a complete build of WebKit that doesn't depend on any proprietary component from Apple or from any of the other ports. Like, for example, there's a PlayStation port that also uses some. Uh, specific components which are not open source. Um, and in particular, WP focuses on embedded devices. Um, and it's uh, full open source, like I said. And uh, this is the part, a web engine is the part of the browser that uh, does the painting and handles the web content, processes user input, and gives you something rendered that you can uh, show to the user. Uh, but it's not a full browser. And that's an, an important uh, distinction here. So you can think about it as packaging the part of a web browser that handles the web content into a separate library that then applications can use. And uh, it has a multi-process architecture these days, well, it has been for quite a long while. I will just touch very quickly on it because that affects uh, some bits about how it can be customized, uh, but uh, it's gonna be very brief anyway. Um, so um, you may be wondering why should I put a web engine in my product in my device, um, paraphrasing someone else, uh, the web is it in the world, it's everywhere. Like you have even native or so-called applications which are basically web content uh, inserted into the application, either taking the full space of the application or some part of it. Um, 
there's uh, well, <laughs> people used there used to be this moniker that there's an app for that. I would like to reach to the point where we can say there's a website for that, so we don't depend on particular applications and anyone with a compliant uh, user agent with a compliant web browser can access the same uh, applications without needing, uh, without mattering that they have an iPhone or an Android device or whatsoever. That would be great. Um, and we're also at the point, or we have been at the point for a few years now, that embedded devices are powerful enough to run a, run a full-fledged web engine. Um, there may be the case still sometimes that we want to trim it a bit and cut some parts that maybe our device is not going to use, uh, which is also possible. But in general, uh, we can just pick any contemporary uh, system on chip released in the last 10 years, and we can throw a web engine at it. It will perform better if it's newer, of course, but it's, it has been possible for a while. And um, also another thing of, uh, that is nice of web technologies is that anybody can put up some HTML, prototype something quickly, and then iterate over it, and that can be quite fast. You don't need to be rebuilding uh, full system images to test uh, your changes to your application or to your part of your user experience that is uh, done using web technologies. And that's a strength that uh, we don't see with every kind of uh, framework that is there to do user interfaces. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the selling points of using web technologies. Uh, like I said, WP is particularly designed to be embeddable. Uh, it's platformless from the point of view that it doesn't depend on a toolkit. So you don't uh, bring with it the dependency on GTK or Qt or any other kind of um, graphics toolkit. So you can tack it on, on anything as long as it can render the web content, it has some GL support, you can get out something that is uh, painted frames of web, web content and give it uh, user input. Uh, so that's, um, that's the point of being platformless, that it allows to adapt it to many situations and many kinds of devices. And like I said, it can be standard. Uh, we will touch on this because I think it's important for embedded devices and custom user experiences. Uh, quite adaptable as well. Like I said, uh, just a moment, one example is that you can trim it down and disable some components you may not need. Like for example, you can disable the multimedia support and have a build that only uh, shows documents and doesn't show videos or audio, for example, which can be interesting for some devices. Um, and the set of dependencies it has, uh, therefore, is quite minimal, which can be a strength as well. Um, and also, it has been available for quite a while. Um, nowadays, it's upstream, uh, ready to pick from build systems typically used on embedded development. Uh, you can find it in Yocto. Um, people from Igalia, some of my colleagues actually maintain the meta WebKit layer, where you can get the recent versions first, basically. And um, usually we try to keep uh, work in the last and previous to last and sometimes the previous one still uh, versions of Yocto. Uh, so any version of Yocto typically that is from the last year and a half or two should have uh, the possibility of have the latest version. Uh, it's available in BuildRoot. I maintain the packaging for BuildRoot myself. Um, I have pending an update to, to the li latest release, but basically uh, it's going to be done in the next weeks after this. Uh, after the conference, and uh, PTXDist also has uh, packages, but uh, non, nobody from Igalia maintains them. But uh, last time I checked, they are quite up to date as well. Uh, the, it's also available in distributions, so you can use APT on Debian or Ubuntu, install a release that is relatively recent uh, on Arch Linux as well, and you can get a taste of it in your desktop. It works on desktop as well. Um, and I was checking the other day the first commit uh, for WP, and it's six years old already. So that's a pretty good uh, track. Not as uh, old as WebKit, of course, but pretty old by now in terms of, uh, of technologies that are used around IT. And it's actually a little bit older. Uh, it started life, this is kind of an anecdote, as uh, WebKit for Wayland, and then it was renamed. So it's actually a little bit older than six years. Uh, very quick introduction about multiprocessing WebKit. Um, as a modern browser, uh, it tries hard to be able to uh, isolate sites from each other and protect the user from, let's say, um, malign websites trying to sniff on others and so on. So uh, the main uh, 
the main thing is that uh, there may be multiple web processes. So you have your browser or your application uh, that embeds the WebKit web view widget. That's like the main entry point in the API. Um, and then that automatically uh, spawns as many web processes as it needs to handle web content in different, uh, in different uh, sites. Usually it's one different process per site uh, to achieve this uh, isolation. And the one network process that takes care of uh, fetching resources from the internet and so on. And uh, this uh, separation also allows to, to sandbox the different processes and, for example, not give any networking um, capabilities to the web process and so on. So this is a uh, security feature that come built in um, with, um, with WebKit. Uh, and this will come in uh, useful to explain a thing that I have later. <laughs> Uh, so first uh, thing is if I'm considering to add a web engine to uh, my device, my product, whatever I'm doing, first of course, what I, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, check whether my hardware is supported. We do have a um, hardware support list in the web page. It is uh, fairly complete from the point of view that it has all the devices that we have personally uh, verified that it works uh, reasonably well or that we have first-hand reports from people we know uh, that have, uh, have tested it. Uh, that doesn't mean your hardware is not supported. That means it might be or it may not be, <laughs> as, you can, as you can imagine. So if it's supported, perfect. If it's not, well, uh, this is something that people usually don't think much about it, but there's a number of requirements that if your platform, if your hardware um, meets them, it's very likely it's going to work, either with uh, existing integrations or uh, with some additional work bringing up the hardware. Uh, the minimum, minimum, bare minimum we have is uh, we need GLES to support. We, I will get in, into this later as well. We would like to increase the requirement to 3.0, but there's uh, platforms we want to support that are still in 2.0. And uh, some mechanism for sharing graphics buffers between the different processes. And this is one of the places where the multiprocess architecture intro comes handy. Uh, we have the web content process that renders it. Once it's done, we have to pass this to the user application, which is in a different process, so it can be displayed. So of course, we need some mechanism for moving buffers in between those processes with pixel data. Uh, ideally, uh, we would recommend you try, if you, are, if you are in the position of being able to choose your NAS hardware, Please pick a 64-bit uh, system on chip or CPU. That helps a lot. And there's a number of uh, EGL and EGLES extensions, which uh, they're not strictly required, but make things more performant and, um, and definitely help, especially with the part about uh, passing buffers among processes. Um, the most, uh, I would say the most important thing to keep in mind for new new developments is uh, try to get something that supports uh, DMEI buff, uh, which is the kernel, Linux kernel uh, buffer sharing mechanism that, uh, that it's, uh, it's, I think it's kernel 4.3 onwards or something like that. So it's nothing new uh, and uh, it, should be, uh, it should be the best option uh, because it avoids copying uh, pixel data. Like, it doesn't do it in every case, but that's the possibility in many cases of have uh, the buffers that are painted, directly pass them through different processes and they can get to the display without doing any further composition, which is the best uh, possible outcome from a performance point of view. And uh, tying in with um, GL support and buffer sharing and so on, um, I would like to talk a bit about issues we have found uh, that makes things more complicated when bringing up uh, WP on, on hardware, on the base, devices especially. And um, we have, uh, I think the main issue until recently is precisely that the DMI buff support or the Wayland support even is, has been missing sometimes or deficient at best or has been buggy and um, I could give examples, but I don't want to blame any, any vendor of drivers. Like they do hard work and making drivers is, 
it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, nevertheless, the situation is getting much better nowadays, and basically, the, uh, most of the new system on chips have been seen lately. Most of them either have uh, Wayland support, which is good and stable, and, and or the MABUF support, which is the best possible option. Um, there are still many proprietary drivers that support only the EL ELES2, which is the reason why we keep it as a baseline. Um, and then this is a funny thing, a very modern system and chips may only have a Vulkan driver, which is not necessarily a problem, uh, but we don't have that Vulkan support in WebKit. Uh, so what we can do, for example, is um, uh, use uh, Sync, which is a component that comes in Mesa, which is a GL, GL driver that is uh, under, the, under the hood implemented in terms of Vulkan. Uh, so, um, that works with WP today. I have tested sometimes some Intel GPUs and also on a, uh, Radeon AMD GPUs. Uh, and it, it generally tends to work, but it's, it's not as well tested as a uh, driver that directly supports uh, GL. Uh, and I think the worst case that I have found is cases where there isn't a driver or the driver is basically impossible to use. And in some cases, we have used uh, MESA's software rasterizer with, uh, with in some devices. That's not an option I would recommend at all. It's uh, going to be doing all the rendering in the CPU. If your display is small, uh, maybe an option. We're talking hundreds of pixels by hundreds of pixels. Uh, you, it, uh, a modern CPU can keep up with 60 frames per second on a reasonable reasonably small screen. So if you have a very small device with a very small screen and you don't have the possibility of adding a GPU to it, it may be an option, but I would say um, shouldn't be your, best option, your, first, uh, your first option. And uh, something that is a recurrent topic is uh, open source drivers tend to work more reliably. And even if they don't, uh, something we can do uh, is dive into them, find out where the problems are, and sometimes even suggest the improvements needed ourselves. And um, this ties in a bit with um, having colleagues at Igalia that have knowledge on this because we have a, a graphics development team as well. So we can, we can directly ask people who know, like, I need this from Mesa, from this driver. Can we make it work? And in that, from that point of view, it's much better to have open source drivers. Uh, then another <laughs> kind of situations where it has been a bit tricky to get WP working is when the hardware is uh, somewhat a bit odd or has some uh, limitations. Uh, like for example, if um, you have a display panel which is only 16 bits, bits per pixel, uh, we have a uh, couple of years ago added a kind of escape hatch that you can hard code which kind of pixel format WebKit is gonna use uh, to use uh, 16 bits per pixel, but it's only that case covered. So we may need to patch WebKit if we need a similar escape hatch for other pixel formats. Uh, that is something that improves with DMI buff because in that case we can get from the kernel the information about which pixel formats the hardware prefers. Um, so that works much better, but uh, well, it's possible to get, for example, non-32 bits per pixel modes working. It's less tested, of course, so I would recommend to either have uh, drivers with DMA bus support or go for a, a, a 24 bit per pixel or 10, 32 bit per pixel display, which makes things more uh, tested and uh, reliable. Uh, then we have the situation of, uh, this is funny hardware in the point of view that uh, you may have your device that is uh, standing on a table, let's say, it could be a speaker, let's say, a smart speaker, has a screen. And maybe the screen is physically attached in a way that the bottom part of the screen is in the top. So you ha we have to do the render uh, flipped around or rotated. Uh, flipped is usually fine. There's, uh, there's flags inside WebKit that can flip the whole rendering. That's okay. A rotato rotation is a bit trickier. Um, if you have a display that is designed to be a landscape and you put it in portrait in some device, well, that's the kind of case. It also works. Uh, it's, it's quite reliable on Wayland to do that because the compositor takes care of it. Uh, we have some support to uh, directly use rotation on 
uh, DRM data rendering kernel setting devices. It's, uh, it works. It's a bit less tested and doesn't cover all the possible corner cases that a compositor may be handling for you, but it can be made to work. But it's a thing to keep into account if you want less travel to get things integrated, mm, try to avoid, especially the rotation modes. But it's, uh, it should work anyway. And um, then sometimes we have some, some situations we have had in which we had to attack the hardware directly. Uh, so instead of going through the kernel or going through um, a, a, an existing compositor, uh, we may uh, need sometimes to access a screen to render using some SPI interface, for example, or some legacy frame buffer device interface uh, with, uh, with a driver that exists but cannot be updated to do uh, DRM and kernel mode setting, for example. Uh, this, is do this is doable. Um, the, the trick with it is um, uh, it's not one of the methods for accessing output screens that is uh, built in into WebKit or uh, the existing browsers. So then it's going to be a bit more of development because you're going to need to do this thing of uh, picking each render frame that comes from WebKit and handle yourself how to push it to your screen uh, and so on. The possibility is there. It's, uh, and sometimes it's what you need, uh, but it's... Um, it's usually a bit uh, more tricky than, uh, than something that is commonly tested, of course. Uh, then, of course, once you have gone over your hardware, what is supported, what not, uh, you need to add a browser to your device. And we have, uh, in order of increasing complexity, we have COG, which is kind of a reference browser, like a single window, even though it's getting support for multiple ones. Anyway, it's a, it's a program. You can run it. Uh, it works. It may be that it doesn't do what you want. You may want to embed something into something else, make your own browser, design your own user experience. Uh, it comes with a library that you can reuse. So, for example, you don't need to implement a Wayland client that picks the frames from WebKit, pushes them to the compositor, and yet you can, uh, for example, add some user interface around the web view and uh, do your own thing without, uh, without writing everything from scratch. And of course, you can do your own thing completely, just get raw EGL images from WebKit and paint them into a, um, I don't know, texture cube and have websites, websites rotating into, into a cube in each, one website in each side with different web views. You can do that too. Um, there's one option that uh, I don't have here mentioned, which is um, we have a new WPA, WP platform li uh, library coming up in not sure if it's going to be September in the September release or the next one, but it's coming up, and uh, it's going to replace in it's going to replace Cog and Cog Core and the library for most cases we hope, and that comes integrated with WebKit, so you don't need to build a separate component either. So it's going to be nice. Uh, just to give an example of the amount of effort, uh, I'm not doing. A, we're not supposed to read it. It's just to show the difference in code. Uh, this is if you reuse the COG library, how a very minimal browser, there's just a window with a web page, uh, would be done. And it doesn't have any error checking. The text is quite small. doesn't matter to give you an idea. This is what we are aiming for with the new API that is uh, coming in some, either in September or in the March release 2025. We're not sure yet. Uh, so the idea is that it should be as easy as this to create a basic a one window browser that um, that doesn't do anything special out of the supported uh, platforms, which uh, at the moment is Wayland and DRM mainly. So that's that's where we're trying to get. Uh, and I think this is uh, probably the most interesting part for some of you, which is which options do I have once I have WebKit running, once I have um, a browser that shows web content, how can I make that web content interact with the rest of the outside world, outside of the web? Uh, let's say I have some sensors, I have some special input method, like my, maybe I have like a spinning wheel that is a rotary encoder, or I have some a custom keypad, etc. How do we get that done? Um, and the input part is, uh, is easy. It's basically you push the events through libwp, and they go to the web view. So I'm going to focus more on what the web content can do to affect things outside. 
And, uh, and of course, the final goal is to have a well-packaged product that is well-integrated. And uh, often we see people rolling their own web server that runs locally in the same device, wasting resources in the device, and add, adding latency and doing round trips through the loopback interface. Let's, let's try not to do that. I mean, it's an option. Uh, sometimes it's the best option, but there is no need. And uh, we have found that often people don't know that it's possible to do better. So um, going from the easiest to the more complicated, first we have uh, support for URI scheme handlers in, in WebKit. So uh, there's this web context object that you can use to configure some parts uh, of how WebKit behaves. And one of the API calls we have there is to register a new URI scheme, which basically you give it a name and uh, a callback, which is native code. And whenever a load happens for, um, for uh, an URL that instead of HTTP has, for example, this echo uh, colon dash dash and something, is going to call uh, that callback. So you can turn any fetch or XML HTTP request or any page load into a native call. And that native call um, can do anything it wants as long as it returns some content to, uh, to the client, to the client in between calls because it's all in the same process, but to the client code that is trying to fetch that URL. Uh, this is a very silly example that just picks the same URL you get and sends it back as plain text. But you could enable some lights, uh, blink some beeps and uh, bus some buzzers and then return some something that says your coffee is ready and that will be fine. Um, and like I said, you can use any native library or any kernel facility uh, to do whatever needed. Uh, that's a bit of trickery with it because uh, it's a cross-origin request from maybe you have been loading your, uh, your content, your HTML from file protocol, and then you're accessing this echo protocol or some other custom scheme protocol. Uh, there's possibility also to set it up in such a way that it works despite the cross-origin request uh, protections that the web engine does. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that, but there's a blog post uh, that is referenced in the slides that uh, has a link to an example uh, with uh, how to do this. And then the next in order of complication and flexibility is um, using user skip messages. Remember this, uh, we have web process for the content, we have the UI process which is your, where you use the API of WebKit where you have your browser, your application. Uh, this is gonna involve some serialization from one process to another and back. Uh, but it's easy to use from the point of view that you have this other object that is the, con the user content manager that you can attach uh, different things to it to modify how web content is loaded. And one of the things you can do is uh, register one of those message handlers. Uh, when you give it a name, um, then you can connect to a signal in the content manager and we'll see how that gets invoked from JavaScript, but this basically gives you a JavaScript endpoint that you can send a payload that is a JavaScript object, which can contain strings, uh, numbers, etc., some data, and you get the data in your callback, which is again native code, can do anything you want. Um, so, for example, here uh, you will get your callback and you get the GSC value, which is uh, GSC, is JavaScript core, is the JavaScript engine in WebKit. So basically you can inspect this value that you got from the JavaScript code in your C or C++ native code do anything you need from the data you get and then send a reply. And the, the way this works in JavaScript is uh, you get a promise. Uh, if you are not familiar with it, it's a kind of JavaScript object that when the request has been completed either calls a callback that you provide or you can use this um, newer await syntax that you can, uh, your JavaScript code is going to be suspended until the asynchronous reply comes. And uh, WebKit handles automatically for you uh, the serialization from the web process to the UI process and back. So uh, this is quite easy to use and usually um, when we advise people to use this and when we see people use this kind of um, user messages, um, there's usually some wrapper API in JavaScript that makes it easier to use and you have some functions that um, create the messages and and, uh, and send them to make it easier to use for the people developing the web applications. 
and like I was saying, it's asynchronous, there's no message passing. If you need something, if you are doing something that needs performance, this may not be the best option. Let's say uh, you need to pass big amounts of data to some external device that is some kernel driver. Then you may want the complicated way, but most flexible, which is the JavaScript core API. Um, we saw it a little bit earlier, like you get with the user messages, you get a GSC value. The native API, you can define new functions, you can define new classes, you can define new objects, you can uh, push values on the JavaScript context, you can do anything you need to implement a JavaScript API. Plus, uh, you have access to um, array buffers, which means you can pass data in between JavaScript and your native code without uh, copying it. So basically, your native code gets a reference to the data buffer uh, underlying the JavaScript structure. Uh, this is a very silly example of uh, how would you make a native function uh, that uh, uses a GSC value to do something with it. It could be anything else, of course. And uh, the thing we need to register native functions or add classes, etc., is a uh, execution context. Uh, once we have it, there's a series of functions in the API, for example, to create functions and assign the function as a global, and then we can use it from JavaScript, and it works. Um, now, the tricky part is, where does this JavaScript context come from? Well, there's two... It's not that there's two ways, but the JavaScript library, JavaScript core, can also be used standalone. So if you want to make tools that use the same, um, the same uh, APIs that you have been doing for the web applications to use, you can also use it like a kind of mini Node.js, but without Node. So you can reuse the, web, uh, the WP WebKit library to run uh, JavaScript programs on the console, for example. So you can create it yourself. The thing is, if you have a web page, it's more complicated because the whole web engine handles creating the JavaScript context for you. Uh, to have your code in the web process, uh, WebKit can load uh, plugins, which we call uh, web process extensions. And uh, there's a certain API uh, that WebKit lets you know when a page has been created, which means uh, there's a new page loaded, lets you know when um, the window object has been cleared, that's the global for the, for the web content. And then uh, when you handle those signals, when the page is created and then when the window object is cleared, that's the best point to add your own APIs on top. Uh, so we basically give you the building blocks to get to the point where, here, now's the GSC contest with an uh, empty global object that only has the web uh, base standard web APIs. Now you can add your stuff. And it's a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit complex, but it has to be like that because of the multiprocess architecture and WebKit handling all the page load and base uh, standards web APIs for you. Uh, but it, it works well and you drop your plugin in a directory and configure it from the uh, UI, UI process side telling where to load extensions from and it will happily do it. You can even, um, you can even reuse existing uh, browsers like COG and set uh, extensions directory and customize new JavaScript APIs without rebuilding the browser because being loadable pl plugins, uh, there's no need for full WebKit rebuild or anything. So that's, that's pretty neat. And some links for whoever wants to check later. It's basically things I've been talking about, about integrating and extending WebKit uh, with some uh, examples and reference documentation. Um, and once we have everything super integrated with our device, what do we do? Are we gonna forget about it? No, we need to update. Uh, this may be especially important if your device loads web content through the internet. As we know, software is hard, getting everything right is hard, there's uh, security vulnerabilities, etc. cetera. Um, browsers should be updated, or web engines should be updated. Um, we have had, in the last years, quite a good uh, track record on providing security updates. I would, like to, um, I would like to point that out, because we have seen many cases in which uh, people get a uh, certain WebKit version and then it remains without updates for two years, one year, three years. Um, 
And, uh, and then it happens like with a Nintendo DS that because it has an old WebKit, uh, somebody manages to load some HTML that breaks it and jailbreaks it and we don't want that. Uh, or well, it's nice to jailbreak a console, but <laughs> if we're the product designers with that hat on, we don't want that. Um, so from the point of view of releases, we do two major releases per year. Uh, those are the ones that include new features but despite that, we try really, really hard to keep the same API and ABI uh, so people don't need to rebuild their programs. Um, that has worked quite well. And even Debian, the distribution, which is quite conservative at the new packages, has been picking security updates from major releases, which is, uh, I think, quite, a, quite an achievement. Um, we do have uh, documented... Um, uh, documented policy for updates and requirements for building, uh, which we have been following thoroughly, and that's what has helped with uh, having distributions pick updates. And uh, basically, we tease them with a carrot of this is our promise to you. We're not going to add new dependencies, or if we add them, you're going to be able to disable them, so you don't need to update other packages. You can update WebKit only with your same base system. And that has been working well with distributions and also with some customer projects we have had where updates have been uh, shipping quite promptly after the new major releases even. So yes, you should ship the updates. Uh, we do try hard to not break things. Uh, sometimes it happens, it's unavoidable, uh, so you may want to skip the dot zero major release. Often, a couple of weeks after, there's the point one, point two, which fixes uh, whatever may have regressed. Most of the regressions are usually built-time regressions because there's so many different ways and options to build WebKit that it's easy to, uh, for example, do something that breaks the build disabling the multimedia support that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, so that's the kind of things we usually fix in, in point releases, plus um, uh, reliability and, se and security fixes. Um, so. Picking minor releases should be a no-brainer, basically. Uh, those, I don't remember when it was the last time a minor release broke anything. Um, major releases, try it first, and from that point of view, it's good to do some automated testing. There is good web driver support, which is a standard API to um, uh, control a web engine and tell it to do things like a user would do, like search for this button, simulate a tap on it, um, scroll a bit now, um, this kind of stuff. Uh, so you, uh, you can test your web applications inside uh, your devices. It's even possible to connect a web driver client from, a, let's say, a computer uh, that has a network connection to your embedded device, uh, run the web engine in the embedded device, and then they talk over the network, and the uh, computer is uh, orchestrating this uh, testing. Um, I think the most impressive setup I have seen, too bad I don't have a picture, was a um, closet, maybe almost as big as this projection screen, uh, with uh, shelves full of devices, all connected with, uh, over the network with a computer that was next to it. And they would basically uh, run their uh, base images with the newer web kits or the newer versions of everything and do testing with WebDriver automatically to check that their web parts will also uh, work correctly. That's, that's, that's something I, I want to encourage people to do. Because uh, if there's any regression in WebKit, you are going to likely catch it if you test it. Um, so um, another technique I have seen is uh, having different integration queues, one for, uh, let's say, regular point releases, and another one for the next in-development releases. So before uh, we do the, um, each major release, we usually do some checkpoints where we have development releases. And those usually, they may break things, of course, uh, but they usually build and they're minimally tested from the point of view that they should build and run reasonably. So uh, I've seen people have a different integration queue that uses the latest development release instead of the latest stable point release. That way you start preparing for the next major release ahead from it's, uh, its date of release. And then it's easier to, um, to integrate a new major version. Uh, so wrapping up, um, and we'll have some time for questions, hopefully. Um, 
WP is very adaptable, it sure can fit your needs if you need a web engine or if you are considering a web engine. We have a checklist for, well, I showed a checklist for uh, features hardware must support to work, but we have also a list of supported hardware. It's uh, great to check it. If we get reports of hardware that works, we may update it. So if you manage to get WebKit in something, send us a pull request. We'll be happy to double check it and apply it. Um, as usual, common hardware and common drivers and free software components are easier to deal with. Um, try to do the minimum of effort possible that covers your integration needs. So use a pre-existing pre browser or pre-existing library that lets you do a browser, etc. Uh, do roll your own if you need, that's fine, uh, but try to avoid it. Um, prefer integrating directly with WebKit instead of having round trips to a local web server and uh, design um, your QA for also testing WebKit updates, see what you would test updates for the whole system. It's part of your firmware, let's say, you should test it as well. And um, that's, I think, the main points I want to make with, with this. So I think we have maybe a minute or two for questions. Hi, so one of the pain points people have when they are developing web applications is sometimes they are pulling like a hundred node packages that might have compatibility issues with certain versions of rendering engines, right? So can you talk a little bit about the tools that are available for people that are developing web applications mm. to use when they have those kind of problems? Yes. Uh, so the question is about uh, complex web applications and how to uh, test them and debug, debug them using an embedded browser, in this case, WebKit-based. Um, I think the main web developer tool that there is is the Web Inspector. It's uh, similar to the built-in Web Inspector in a desktop browser. Uh, with the difference that it's a remote web inspector. So you may be running your web view or your web browser in some device and instead of directly checking on the screen of the device because maybe it's a small or maybe it doesn't even have a screen, it could be a headless device, uh, you connect remotely to it and you load the web inspector interface in your laptop um, and connect to the device and then you can uh, check your web application, like edit the CSS, check how's the DOM tree, like, like all the usual features of a web inspector, uh, you can find them in the remote web inspector. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit tricky from the point of view that it requires a WebKit-based browser uh, on the machine that connects to the remote inspector. Um, do we have support recently, well, since a year ago, to load it over HTTP. And last time I checked, it mostly worked in Firefox and it works fine in Chromium. So you can also use Chromium uh, typically to connect to the remote web inspector over HTTP. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, I think that would be the main, um, the main debugging aid for web developers. You know, I'll add to that that I've used Safari for the remote uh, debugging and it works against COG. Hmm. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of different ways to integrate with the device. Um, I've been using WebSockets on localhost uh, because that allows me to push information from the device hmm. to the to the browser. Um, of the alternatives that you suggest, which which is the simplest, like I don't think you could probably do that with the URI schema handler, or could you push mm. through that? I think it depends on the question is um, if one is using WebSockets in a local server to push events to the web content. Uh, if one wants to avoid the local server, what's the best option? Um, so I think it depends on the kind of events. Uh, I would probably try to. In general, I think I would try to do it in my browser. Uh, which maybe reuses the COG library uh, to pick those events from native code. And, uh, uh, and um, how would I say? And that the, the, the JavaScript subscribes to them uh, using 
uh, using user script messages. Uh, so it gets a promise, and whenever there is an event, the promise gets resolved. Um, that's, that's probably the easiest in this case. Is the user script messages mm. method. Yeah. Okay. If the overhead of the IPC between the two processes is still too much, because it's going to be, I think it's going to be a bit, in general, it's going to be a bit better than going through WebSockets and wrapping through an extra protocol and so on. Uh, but if it would be mm, not fast enough, uh, you could also do it uh, with the JavaScript core API. But at that point, maybe the complication is not worth it. Yeah. I think it depends a bit. Okay. If you need the performance and maybe you want to avoid the, um, the memory usage of, uh, of the local web server. WebSockets, if one has to once or ends up using a local server, WebSocket is probably the, the fastest from the point of view of minimizing latency anyway. So it's, like it's hard to say that there's a, a solution that would work in every case. I think I would probably use user script messages uh, for this kind of case Thank if you. performance is good enough. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you cannot answer this if you want, because I feel like it may be uh, kind of stepping into the other talk you guys are giving today on uh, doing testing. But mm -hmm. when you're talking about like platform or picking the right hardware and, and getting your platform established to run WebKit on it, do you have any good recommendations as far as um, how to like verify that all like browser functionality is hmm. working? Because I mean, we've ran into issues where it's like, yeah, I mean, everything works, but then when you interact with the touch screen, like Slider doesn't work, and so. Okay, uh, so for hardware, uh, has a good way to uh, verify that all the features work. Mm, I would like to have a good answer that says use this and it works, uh, and and you can test everything. Um, I don't think there is like a definitive answer to that. Um, I would say if it's um, if it's something common that is common hardware that maybe we test regularly, like what we use the most uh, is uh, is IMX uh, platforms or quite often Raspberry Pi or similar. Um, so the, this this kind of uh, system on chips which are really common, usually things work. I think the tricky point, like you said, is with uh, touch input because there's uh, lots of different uh, kinds of uh, touch panels people can use with the same basic system chip. Um, and we have had regressions with touch input at some point in some major release, which then got fixed, but it's, there's still some bugs, that's true. Um, I think probably the best way is to think which kind of interactions you need in your applications, like I need a pinch, I need a, I'm sure gonna use a scroll, I'm gonna use, etc. Uh, design some simple uh, HTML only, very basic thing that you can simulate the touch input with using WebDriver and maybe test it with that if you want to keep it then later for the continuous integration. But uh, I, I cannot think of anything that is pre-made that you could directly use. Maybe, maybe I just, I don't know it, but, maybe, but at least I don't, I'm not aware. Yeah, the web driver stuff sounds really interesting. I'm looking forward to that talk later today. Hmm. Or tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think it's the end of my time. Um, is it 50 past, yes. Um, I wouldn't want to steal time for, from the next uh, speaker. So um, thank you everybody for coming. And if you have anything else you may want to ask, discuss, um, tell us, uh, we're going to be upstairs in the, in the expositor's room in the fifth floor. Thank you. <laughs>